From Microbe TV, this is Tweevo, This Week in Evolution, episode 29, recorded on March 19th, 2018. Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Utah, Nels LD. Hello from LD Lab Studios, nestled here in the foothills of the Wasatch Mountains. Beautiful Wasatch Mountains. Now we're talking snow capped, even. It's yeah. been, uh, yeah, we've had some late snow. It's been a little bit of a dry winter, and so, um, but catching up, even in the last. A week or so, maybe three feet, almost four feet of snow in the mountains, and so nice. not too shabby. What about there in the flats? You have snow there? A little bit, but it um, all melts. This is like the great time of the year where you mm. don't have to shovel snow, but you can still enjoy it uh, up nice. in the, if you drive up to the mountains. Yeah. Have you uh, been doing a lot of traveling? Oof, yeah, too much. <laughs> <laughs> Out on the tours here. Um, a couple of seminars. So I was just in San Francisco last week, Michigan the week before. And uh, Kansas University, the Jayhawks, the week before that. Nice. How about you? What have you been up to? What's the latest from NYC? Well, I was just at Drew University on Saturday, Mm. small college in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And it is the home of Brianne Barker, who's on TWIV now and then. Mm -hmm. And I was speaking at a Tri-Beta, that's Beta, 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 National Honor Society Conference. So they have local chapters, local colleges, and they send their students there, and they give posters, they give talks, and it's a lot of fun. You see the scientists of the future. Yeah, great. And they're really excited. But now I am st- now, um, I'm now i going to start doing a lot of traveling for the next couple of months. Yeah, so yeah. the next couple of weeks, yeah, going all over the place. Nowhere near Salt Lake City, though. I'm going to be flying over you on Thursday. <laughs> I'm heading to Caltech ah. to celebrate David Baltimore's 80th birthday. Yeah, that's right. How about Coming that? Fast. Yep. I just re- well, when I was at uh, UCSF, ran into Raul Andino. Yeah. Uh, and he'll also be there, it sounds like. He he's will. Got, he's talking, yeah. Yeah, he was gearing up for his talk. He was, he was very excited for that opportunity. I'm sure. So that should be interesting. It'll be a big event. Yeah. 80 years old. <laughs> well, and many, many uh, trainees over the years as well, right? So yeah. So a lot of his trainees come back for this. And they have we have dinner on Friday night, but just the number of amazing people that he has trained is incredible. You know, they they include people who are like university presidents and deans and all this stuff. Besides great scientists, it's really quite remarkable. Agree. And yep. Very unique. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, the and I'm teaching this semester of my virology course. It's about halfway through. They're just coming back from spring break today, so ah. we'll resume the last half of the course. I'm I'm always excited to do that. Yeah, hopefully they're rested up, and uh, maybe even you know some students could have enjoyed some skiing out here for spring break. And sure, back you know, into- the the Wednesday before break. Uh, it was a snow day here here at Columbia. They canceled classes, so I recorded the lecture and I. I sent it to them over the break, and I, you know, I'm thinking, you know, if you're lying on a beach, you don't have anything to do, just watch <laughs> this lecture on intrinsic and innate defenses. <laughs> there you go, pretty sweet. <laughs> I'm sure nobody watched it, but that's fine. Yeah. But no, of course, uh, yes. Is there another storm coming your direction? I yeah, I just saw it today. There's another storm due on spring. That's uh, 21st. Is that the first day of spring? Mm-hmm. Correct. Yep. Uh, 20. That would be Wednesday. Yeah, supposedly. Supposed to get some snow. Yeah, hopefully I'll be able to fly out. So is that Baltimore birthday? Is that this coming weekend? Yeah, I'm flying out on Thursday afternoon, so I think it should be okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll also, you won't stop here, but actually I'll also be in California. Um, oh, yeah. we'll, let's see, a little farther north maybe? Uh, Monterey, there's mm. a aid immunity meeting. Nice. Hosted by, um, organized by Sarah Cherry, uh, Harmeet Mullock, mm-hmm. and one one or two others. I'm blanking at the moment. So, oh, Russell Vance, I think, from uh, Berkeley. That should be really fun, too. You bet. Yep. Yeah. And here we have Tweevo, number 29. Tweevo 29. Although, if I might, just for one quick second, <laughs> <laughs> speaking of science meetings, I just wanted to put in a quick plug 
for an upcoming local meeting here. It's a SMBE, that's Society for Molecular Biology and Evolution. It's a satellite meeting in Deer Valley, Utah. This is May 9th through 12th, under two months now. And the title of the meeting is Molecular Evolution and the Cell. I mentioned it on our last Twivo, number 28. Think of it like Twivo on steroids. And in fact, <laughs> we will have um, several past Twivo guests on hand and in person. So Nicole King, um, who spoke to us about some of her work with the coenoflagellates, thinking about the origins of multicellularity, she will be here in person. Uh, Nitin Fudness, a local with his uh, Drosophila species and thinking about the origins of species, the division of one species to two. And uh, Utah's very own Mike Shapiro, the pigeon genetics guy, yeah. Evo Devo of nice. pigeons, of course, is one of the, both Nitin and Mike are organizers um, as well. Uh, sounds great meeting. Sounds great. Fun stuff. So uh, abstracts are due for posters and talks April 1st and all inclusive lodging. All meals included up at Deer Valley Resort. It's going to be really fun. We've got some great um, people already signed up, so please join us. Wonderful. Sounds good. All right. And today uh, we're going to try something new on Twivo. Yeah. I'm going to try a snippet. <laughs> I like it. This is borrowing some of the podcasting technology from Twiv. <laughs> high tech, high tech stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, you know, Nails had. Uh, we decided on a paper a couple of weeks ago, I think, and uh, and last week I came across this paper and I said, "Boy, I'd like to talk about it." I actually wrote a blog post and published it last Thursday. Oh, cool! And um, at the end, hopefully, I'll I'll mention something from that post. But it's a uh, it's a, a paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences (PNAS) just this past January. It's called Evolutionary Transition from Blood Feeding to Obligate Non-Biting in a Mosquito. University of Oregon, Oregon Health and Science, uh, University of Birmingham, that's in the UK, University of Notre Dame, Ohio State University. First author is William Bradshaw. And let's see if we have co-first authors here. You got to always, you have to decode. always uh, be careful here. Author contributions now, looks like. Last author is Christina Holzapfel. Mosquitoes, everybody loves them, right? That's right. And to be honest, I wasn't really aware of the possibility of these non-biting lifestyles. I just I didn't either. Assumed. Yeah, I figured all mosquitoes need to take a blood meal. The it's females, the right? Females, correct, to go through the um, ovulation cycles. Yeah. Which are sort of high energy. And the interesting thing is this, like, in order for a mosquito to transmit a virus or parasite, they have to take two blood meals. Mm -hmm. And a couple of weeks ago on Twiv, Dixon said less than 1% of mosquitoes take mm -hmm. two blood meals. They only last about two weeks. Yeah, yeah. So it's a pretty low-frequency event, but as Alan Dove pointed out, there's so many damn mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's a numbers game. <laughs> it's a numbers game, and so it works. But, yeah, they they point out here that there are some non-biting species. There are three genera with uh, members who do not bite. In other words, they don't bite people or animals. They bite plants, right? And they drink sap from the plant. <laughs> <laughs> but they, in this paper, they use bite to mean taking a blood meal. Yeah, and then vegetarians. They're, they're vegetarians, they, they eat <laughs> sap. And they then there's one species, Wyomaya smithi. Yeah, the pitcher plant mosquito. Lovely. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> Where the same in the northern hemisphere, they are, what is it in the northern? Northern are non-biters, mm -hmm. and the southern hemisphere are biters, and they're the ancestors. So apparently the blood biters were first, and then the non-biters evolved. So you can imagine how that happened. Maybe a mosquito found itself with somewhere without mammals. <laughs> yeah, right. Yep. And had to adapt, right? So we have, and that's a great opportunity where you have the same species, two different phenotypes. You can do some genetics, right? Yeah, I agree. And actually, just to rewind, there's one line in the intro that I really liked, which was this idea that hundreds of laboratories have been employing heroic means to eradicate pathogens of humans transmitted by mosquitoes. And all of these efforts assume that the bite will occur. However, what if there is no bite? <laughs> <laughs> yep. 
No bite. Yeah. And so it looks like these pitcher plant mosquitoes have sort of um, moved in that direction. And so wouldn't it be great to understand uh, how they how this happened or what is the genetic basis in some sense of yeah. uh, how this happened? Because maybe if we knew that, we could entice other species to... <laughs> To, to go eat somewhere else, right? That's right, yeah. I'm curious, too. I mean, the pitcher plants, we mentioned this, I guess, actually, even last Twivo, um, how, I mean, there's incredible evolution among these carnivorous plants. So they're, you know, they're trapping insects in the um, kind of elaborate pitcher structures. Mm -hmm. They entice them to land and drown them. Or we were talking about, I mentioned the tree shrew, loo. <laughs> <laughs> the tree shrew shrews are enticed so that would i mean that sounds like another cool co-evolutionary story potentially where the pitcher plant entices the mosquitoes and they sort yeah. of switch over to this non-biting or veggie lifestyle in some sense maybe that's how it started yeah who knows you know a wayward mosquito found a pitcher plant you know new niche to find uh energy and resources possibly yeah, yeah. now they take advantage of this here the idea is let's find out how Biters and non-biters differ. Mm -hmm. I suppose they could have collected biters and non-biters, but <clears throat> they didn't do that. What they did is they collected non-biters, 14,000 of them. Wow. Mm. wow. And basically put them in a cage with a rat mm -hmm. and see which ones landed on the rat and stuck its proboscis in the rat. <laughs> <laughs> so they had to watch carefully, right? <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and they didn't let it take a blood meal. They just watched it until it put the proboscis through the skin and they took it and they bred it and then made it the offspring do the same thing and i think after seven of that of those generations they ended up with a biting derivative of the non-biters mm -hmm. is that incredible yeah how quickly that you can shift between this yeah 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 and and just to mention these are um these are all the same species so yeah. uh, highly related individuals in the same population to begin with yeah so now you can ask how do they differ so they decided to look at the, the transcriptome, all the messengers, compare the biters with the non-biters. And that reminded me, do you hear last week about the astronaut in 7%? Oh, yeah, that was a, a science communication disaster. Disaster. Mm -hmm. They did the same thing with the astronauts. They looked at their transcriptomes, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. And they found 7% difference, but somehow that got translated to 7% mutations in their DNA, which would make him a fish or something, right? <laughs> <laughs> maybe not quite that far, but certainly uh, maybe an older New World monkey, which is a Because pretty... <laughs> uh, the chimp is 1% different from us, right? <laughs> Correct, 99%. Yeah, we're talking more like squirrel monkey or something like that. And, here, and so here they're looking at the transcriptome. So they say, okay, what's different? And it's interesting, they have seven different metabolic pathways that are different. Mm -hmm. And one of them involves the ribosome, the spliceosome, uh, and proteasome proteins, which they say the blood in the blood feeding is associated with differences in these genes. And they say blood feeding females are investing in protein degradation, RNA editing, and translation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you know what's cool here? This is before they even take a blood meal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a key part of this a key insight this is, is anticipation not, yeah yeah that's right <laughs> exactly and i think it also highlights um you know the trickiness in some sense of uh the directness or indirectness of measuring differential gene expression or looking at the transcripts the messages mm -hmm. is that you know you really want to try to uh, enrich for as directive effects as possible and that means both genetics so that these are obviously the same species and individuals from the same populations. Mm. And then also the environmental conditions, right? You want that to be as close right. as possible so that you're seeing like, what is the sort of baseline? I mean that, mm. you know, getting back to the astronauts for a minute, the twins, you know, you might make a case that if you drank, a, I, th I think I saw this somewhere, if you drank a cup of coffee, 7% of your transcripts or your, or your gene expression might differ. Uh, and so, yeah. and so how do you keep that kind of in proper perspective or really interpret that? That's pretty tricky. Yeah. Well, in the end, you're left with numbers and you have to test them, right? You still you can't conclude that all of them are relevant to whatever you're looking at. You have to do some more experiments. Oh, yeah. But I think this is, you know, what's really nice about this study. And again, the reason it's one of the reasons it's cool is that 
because they were so careful to pick as closely related yeah, individuals yeah. as possible and then set up the experiment so that you're kind of hopefully enriching for these um, sort of informative differences in the messages or the difference in the um, gene transcripts, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which then you can do exactly what you're describing, um, but with maybe higher confidence that you don't have to troll through thousands and thousands of potential targets to really get at right, right. key differences in function. Yeah. It reminds me a little bit of, um, and I don't know where this work is now, but when I was a postdoc at the Fred Hutch, there were some researchers who were working with some very rare um, pediatric cancers, tumors, that in fact started developing, um, you know, near birth or right at birth. Mm -hmm. And so they were trying to collect these samples from newborns. Um, in the hope mm. that there hadn't been an, enough time, basically, for those tumors to continue to mutate over, you know, year, day, months, days, years, yeah, yeah, and that that could enrich for the driver mutations that are sort of the um, primary or causative mutations, and you'd have fewer um, passenger mutations. Right, or, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of a similar logic. Very different biology, obviously. They also found in the pyruvate pathway. To take glucose and make energy out of it and other precursors. Seven differentially expressed genes associated with non biting. And they think this means that these non biters are prepared to reallocate energy metabolism in whatever way that's needed. Right? Little flexibility in anticipation of something else. <clears throat> also, genes involved in nitrogen excretion, which the blood. Eaters had upregulated purine and caffeine pathways. There's your cup of coffee. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. And this is a cool one. Um, the uh, the biters were less dependent on seeing and more dependent on chemosensory mm-hmm. approaches, whereas the the non biters were looking around and smelling less. I guess odorants. And yeah, phototransduction. Mm-hmm. So I guess the non-biters need to find that plant, that pitcher plant, right? <laughs> yeah, and uh, that's right. And maybe the pitcher plant is putting out yeah, some, could be. something that's bringing them in for and the, the landing. And the biters are probably looking for CO2 or something, right, that brings them to a mammal so they can bite. Yep, yep. That's another really fascinating and vibrant area of research is to understand uh, the olfaction that goes into, or, or, and other related senses that go into uh, mosquitoes that do bite humans, tracking down how that works. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So they say in their discussion, I love this line, blood feeding, blood feeding is not a free lunch. The <laughs> added nutritional benefits are balanced by extrinsic and intrinsic costs, which are reflected in some of these gene expression changes. Mm-hmm. It's not, yeah, I mean, t- taking blood is... Um, is a requirement in, in an investment in requirement in a lot of things. So it's quite interesting. Totally agree. There's also another um, important, I think, underlying evolutionary concept here, which is this mm-hmm. idea of plasticity. So yeah. how yeah. quickly can you? And I think this is it looks like a really interesting case where, like, you're you know, the as you described their experiment that they you know in seven generations basically were able to enrich for these. Um, kind of reversing back to the blood eating lifestyle. This idea that like all of the genetic machinery is in place and can kind of, you can just sort of turn it back on or Mm -hmm. ramp it back in a moment's notice from an evolutionary standpoint. Um, And that has some really interesting consequences for this idea of plasticity for how fast you can adapt given um, sort of the dynamics of your environment. Mm. And so, yeah, I think that's, there's some interesting work from George um, Zhang. He's at uh, Michigan uh, in this area to mm-hmm. tr- really track how uh, plasticity relates to adaptability. They have some chicken data sets from Tibet, both low and high elevation would be the equivalent of the sort of blood feeders versus the plant feeders in mm. this case. Neat. And, yeah, keep an eye on that. So in the discussion, they talk about Maybe finding master regulators of these sets of genes, right? Because that often happens is that you have an upstream transcription factor that regulates a lot of genes involved in a particular phenotype. So maybe biting and non-biting is one of those. And I was thinking, gee, if you could do that, then maybe you could find an inhibitor or a stimulator of that gene, whichever way it works, right? Put it in a spray 
and you spray yourself. And then when mosquitoes are approaching you and they land on you to bite, they take up this chemical and they're immediately converted into a (laughs) non-biter. Great idea. (laughs) So I I wrote a blog post last week called, called Mosquito Blood Feeding is Not a Free Lunch. And the last paragraph I said, what would we call this spray? And I gave a couple of names, bite switch, bite off, bite no more. And a couple of people in the discussion, one guy said, how about Mozzie Go? <laughs> this is a guy from <laughs> Steve from, from the UK. And another guy said, I vote for Bite Switch. Yeah. yeah Isn't it cool? It's fun. It's great. It's fun. Really fun. <laughs> also, I mean, that il- illustrate like that to actually execute on that, to go through the, from the kind of molecular biology or the gene regulation underpinning all the way yeah. to it. Yeah. I mean, that em- to me really does uh, emphasize that the importance of, picking, you know, of really being able to zero in. So picking these highly related species, the last thing you'd want to do, they mentioned, you know, there are these three different genera, um, that are known to kind of have made those transitions. If you pick those, you've got, you know, thousands, maybe more, um, differences in gene expression that would be really hard to trace back to for sure. Two things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, there you go. And I think you could imagine, uh, looking at some of these genes in eighties, Culicine and opheline mosquitoes that transmit viruses and parasites and see. I, I don't know if you could make one of those a non-biter in the lab and then release it. I'm not sure that that would really be the right approach, you know, because I'm not sure they would ever replace all of them. Yeah, correct. And also I think it gets back to that idea of plasticity where, you know, if they're just releasing them, this is very different than sort of a gene drive scenario where you're kind of putting a... Mm genetic booby trap into the genome maybe if you did both i suppose but if it's just the difference in lifestyle hoping to breed that because there's probably this plasticity um as they even demonstrated by doing just those seven Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. generations it would probably you know go back yeah Yeah, exactly yep you bet all right thanks uh for considering that nels (laughs) <laughs> yeah, fun snippet. I like this. Uh, it's like a, for me, it's like a pop quiz of uh, <laughs> covering a paper. Since I, yeah, well, it's uh, it's worth it because it's cool stuff. A lot of cool stuff. Well, we have a main paper. We do. So let me s- introduce this one. Yep. Um, uh, you sent this a few weeks ago, and I thought, wow, this looks intriguing. Let's let's take a look, and um, I think we'll see a, a little bit of an echo, at least in the sense that here we're kind of also thinking about ecologic uh, ecology, ecology and evolution. Uh, the complexity of uh, ecosystems coming in, or just biological systems, and how that can kind of come into play. Of thinking about um, the evolution not only of hosts, but of the um, infectious microbes that are found in them. Um, and another wing uh, to a theme here: we had mosquitoes a m- moment ago, and now we're going to move to house finches. Mm. Uh, another <laughs> wing critter. Again, we're kind of drawn to these, or evolutionary biologists, I guess, are drawn to these winged critters. I guess. Um, There's some good reasons behind that. So anyway, the paper is entitled, Incomplete Host Immunity Favors the Evolution of Virulence in an Emergent Pathogen. Uh, First author is Arietta Fleming-Davies. And uh, last author is Dana Hawley. Um, These researchers are at Virginia Tech. Um, Also some folks at um, Princeton and the system here, or the idea here, is um, to look at a um, pathogen and whether the host's exposure to that will influence or select for um, sort of increased virulence in, during future infection. So this idea of incomplete host immunity and the outcomes on pathogen evolution. You can imagine it would also influence host evolution. The authors will touch on that at least a little bit. And so the systems at play here, oh, and actually I have one note I wanted to, to mention. So I don't know um, Dana Hawley, but I do know this program that she's supported in part by um, and, and supported some of this work. Um, it's, this NI, it's a joint program between the NIH, the NSF, and the USDA, uh, and the program's in Ecology and Evolution of Infectious Disease. And it's, I just wanted to lift this up for a minute because I think it's a really great integrative program. Um, I've had a, a little bit of exposure to it. So I had one of these K99 awards when I was transitioning from grad school to postdoc and was able, as part of this, to attend one of the meetings, which was bringing together a lot of ecologists, uh, evolutionary biologists, virologists, uh, microbiologists, sort of the whole gamut, 
um, to kind of intermingle and sort of exchange ideas. And for me, kind of coming from a cell biology or a, a molecular biology background, it was really just an incredible opportunity just to make some, meet some new some people and just get exposed to almost a difference in culture, in um, ecology, uh, and e- ecology and evolution approaches, or in, in some cases, field biology approaches. It was really um, eye-opening and inspiring um, and continues, I think, to influence um, some of our work. So anyway, I just wanted to mention that program. I think that that kind of meeting is, is essential. Mixing yeah. up the people because otherwise we hang out with our own, you know. Exactly. Yep. And I mean, it's and just to say, I mean, it's not like all of a sudden it's like simple. We understand each other. Let's just do this. I mean, you yeah. get into these sort of messy, <laughs> chaotic yeah, spaces. Yeah, sure. But from that comes interesting things that are sort of hard to predict. And so, yeah. Anyway, that, that's a it's a really great program, and I'm you know glad to see that it's continue. I'm no longer um, sort of formally affiliated with it, um, but glad to see all this interesting work uh, continuing to emerge from it. Okay, so the host and the microbe in this case, the host is a house finch, a regular visitor, I might add, to my um, front yard bird feeder. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get these guys? You know, oh, yeah. Must, yeah. yeah. Uh, they're kind of, the males have that kind of reddish yeah. color to them. Yeah, kind of yeah, fancy yeah. finches. And um, Mycoplasma uh, galliceptacum is the bacteria, uh, pathogenic bacteria that has, I guess, taken on increasing prevalence, started on the East Coast, it sounds like, and has spread all the way to the West Coast, um, and causes a pretty, can cause a pretty severe conjunctivitis. And I think the authors point out that this can, um, you know, really impair the bird's ability um, just to, literally to see, mm-hmm. which has uh, real consequences in terms of, you know, just getting around or finding food, but also getting picked off yeah. um, by, by <laughs> <Right>. predators. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. <laughs> Yep. That's something I can vouch for as well. Um, so sometimes a sharp shinned hawk will also show up at my yeah, front yard yeah. feeder. Um, I've seen some, the results have been mostly pigeons, which I am actually kind of uh, appreciative of, to be honest, but I haven't seen any finches, although they could be easily um, sort of taken away by the by the hawks. We, uh, we also have hawks, but we have these big glass windows in front, you know, behind the feeders, and they often fly into it. And I wonder if any of them have mycoplasma infection. Oh, true. I can't yeah. see the right. glass, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I guess the that's the trick where not washing your windows actually can save some mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> like you feel good about your laziness. <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah. So the, the main question of this study was this idea of um, incomplete host immunity. And, and so uh, to put it another way, does do exposures to um, weak um, infectious microbes select for virulent, more virulent microbes um, in future infections. And this might also apply to vaccines, right? So where you're exposed to a weakened or killed uh, pathogen or even, you know, proteins from it or epitopes from it, um, whether you could actually, you know, select for in future infections um, bugs that not only sort of get past it, but the reason they do is because they're so so virulent in a sense. And so that's... um, that was, that was the main question of the study. And the basic scheme then that they went forward with was to actually, so first of all, to collect house finches and then in the laboratory to infect them with um, strains of the mycoplasma that were uh, either low, medium, or um, high virulence. And how do they measure virulence there? Yeah, so I'm, I'm looking back at the paper to get that detail. It could be a little bit different in different systems. So um, the relative virulence terms describe the primary exposure strain relative to the second strain. Let's see here. Oh, I think I missed. Yeah, I'm missing it actually. So the less virulent strain indicates that the primary exposure w- was less virulent than the secondary. But I'm looking. I did not so they say here to examine the oh, virulence, yeah. they measure conjuvi- conjunctivitis severity and pathogen load for five weeks. Ah, there it is. Yep. And then conjunctivitis severity, which correlates with disease-induced mortality risk in the wild, was scored from zero to three, and, and the pathogen load was quantified by PCR. Yeah, so that's it. So it's the it's the pathogen load in terms of the bacterial virulence. Um, so the, the, the three that you mentioned, low, intermediate, and high, that's based on conjunctivitis. And then when they actually infected the birds, they measured viral loads as well. Exactly, yeah. exactly. 
Yep. Yep. So then the scheme is to do the, basically the primary infection will be the um, low, medium, or high virulence. And then uh, the and then, birds then are. And PBS as well as something like that. Medium, ex- yeah. Yep. As a control. Yep. Sterile medium. Um, and then a an, uh, subsequent or secondary infection. Um, and then measure virulence of those. And actually, um, they end up doing a reporting on two independent sets of experiments, one with um, uh, mycoplasma that was collected or is maintained from East Coast strains, and then they also have a um, sort of parallel set with uh, West Coast bugs. That was kind of an interesting Mm -hmm. independent case. Um, So then what are the results? So if we, if the first thing that they asked was um, given the differences in those primary exposures, how virulent were the um, bacteria uh, from the secondary infections. And again, remember, this can be that you're doing the low, medium, and virulent strains um, as as part of the second uh, infection as well. Mm-hmm. And so the general trend that they observe, this is in table one, is that there's greater virulence um, of the strains um, when they were for, in the birds that were challenged with the lower virulent strains for the primary infection, if that makes sense. So they measure this basically as um, homologous uh, or less virulence uh, coming out of the second st- secondary infection, homologous virulence, meaning that it matched the level um, that they measured in the primary infection, or uh, more virulent. And if you kind of go across the table, what you can see is that the ones that received the low virulence to begin with had, uh, and then were challenged with low, had homologous virulence loads or pathogen loads, but then had more of a pathogen load if they were subsequently challenged with the intermediate or high virulence strains. However, if you go to sort of the other end of the um, experiment where the primary challenge is with a highly virulent strain, then you end up with um, just a homologous outcome um, at the end. Uh, Whereas it's less virulent if you're challenged with these uh, lower intermediate strains. But perhaps the most, in, for their um, data, perhaps the most um, informative um, or, the, you know, the evidence that pre- supports this idea of sort of incomplete immunity in the context of these um, virulent differences in virulence challenge among the bacteria is the medium case, the intermediate case, where basically you end up with, you're in the secondary infection, you're, you enjoy protection from the low virulence. You have about the same load, um, or the I should, sorry, I should say the bugs coming out of this are less virulent uh, than they are from the primary, homologous for the intermediate, but then more virulent uh, if you're then the secondary challenge is with the high. And so it's that difference that I believe they're trying to highlight, basically this idea that in the secondary infections, you end up with a greater or more virulent load um, than what you were initially uh, protected with. So they actually take the bacteria from infected birds and they measure their virulence? Correct, as quantified by um, the, that qPCR. Mm. Mm-hmm. And this is also, I should say, this is also um, compared not to sort of the um, prime, like just the uh, sort of this experiment, but previous experiments or um, basically with birds infected outside of this setting to kind of set a baseline yeah. for what for what the definition of the virulence is. I didn't think, I thought they didn't actually measure what came out. I thought they only measured what they went into the birds. I'm a little confused here now. Oh. Uh, but you might, uh, yeah, I'm sure you're right because you're a smart guy. <laughs> 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 so I thought they hold, just, hold on. <laughs> they had three strains of low, vi- intermediate, and high virulence, which were measured in separate experiment, right? Mm-hmm. Which caused so much conjunctivitis and, pathogen load right and then they infect first and then they take those birds and then reinfect them again a second time with uh, the same range of of bacteria in terms of virulence and then they get these numbers on the chart which i guess uh combine the the load and the i guess it's pathogen load that we're looking at in the chart those numbers uh you know 1.5 plus or minus 0.23 that's actually just pathogen load and they're using that as a as a indicator for virulence, right? 
That's right. Because um, it's an easy way, I guess, to measure, although you might want to also look at conjunctivitis as well. So, yeah, that's right. So that's why I don't think they actually measured what came in. I guess they, no, all they did is infect the host and see what the first infection does in terms of the virulence of the second infection, right? Correct. So, yeah, that secondary exposure, which is the um, the Y axis. Yeah. So the high virulence strains basically give you a really strong protection against reinfection. You get a lower pathogen load if you're first infected with a higher virulence strain, right? Correct. Yep. Now, do these, do these guys kill? I don't think they had any mortality here, right? No, they don't. And actually, that was one of the questions I had, which is, well, and we'll get to this in a moment. But so, you know, because the finches are kind of brought out of the wild, and this is, I think this becomes a, a, a bigger concept or a, a, a larger point to always keep in mind is, you know, so you're, we're trying or, you know, the whole, one of the whole ideas of ecology is to get a sense of the complexity in yeah. real life and then yeah. to, you know, measure this and or to understand it. Um, and to include the important parameters. Of course, you have when in bringing these things to the laboratory to actually do controlled experiments, you're um, making their trade-offs or compromises for mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that complexity. I think one of the trade-offs that you know immediately jumped to mind for me is, you know, what would happen if these finches were actually in the wild? So they're all kind of safe, and and what would that mean for the population and of the hosts, mm -hmm. and then as a knock-on or connected effect, what does that mean then for the virulence of the bugs? Because it will sort of change the the um, sort of availability of hosts. And so, actually, the authors do address this um, in, and they have a nice phrase in the paper that I'll just um, quote here, which is this idea. So this is kind of um, paraphrasing a little bit, but so the incomplete immunity described here are arguably a specific case of a broader phenomenon whereby increased virulence is favored by quantitative host variation and susceptibility, whether due to host genetic variation, imperfect vaccines, or innate immune priming. Mm. Disentangling differences in susceptibility versus infectiousness is a difficult problem in any system, and we do not attempt to do so here. And so, you know, this raises, uh, <laughs> kind of opens a can of worms on a number of different variables or parameters that you might consider um, in a, you know, as it relates to the host population and what's happening with that, right? So what are past exposures? What is the priming of the immune system? We were just mm, talking about mm, those, mm. those mosquitoes and how plastic they are in their sort of um, responses to the food sources that are available, right? What about these birds? Mm -hmm, mm. And so I think um, you have a whole host of things um, to consider, um, which they do, but also sort of point out that they're kind of limiting this, their scope to think about um, just this uh, sort of hybrid system of taking the birds out of the wild um, and then looking at the um, uh, effect on yeah, pathogen yeah. load and the secondary infections. Um, they do, however, consider, um, you know, also what's happening uh, on the bird side of this as well um, and sort of uh, what does the immunity of the host look like? And so this is in figure one. And what they're measuring here are after basically the... Um, uh, secondary infections, what are the lesion, they score the lesion sizes. So I think mm -hmm. this has to do mm -hmm. with the um, conjunctivitis and um, the impact, basically the lesions that are showing up around the, the eyes um, and mucous membranes there. Um, and then also um, they're scoring, uh, again, for pathogen loads and so um, per individual. And so here they have some uh, histograms showing that the... Um, Basically, you know, the lesion scores are a lot higher if there was no previous exposure, um, sort of intermediate if it was a lower virulent strain. So this gets at this idea that they're, um, when you're challenging with the higher virulence after the lower virulence exposure, that these birds are doing worse when it, as, it, as it relates to the lesion score. Um, and then they have what they call the homologous previous exposure. So this is where they've matched the um, virulence in the first, the primary infection with the virulence of the secondary infection. Those birds actually do quite well. There's, it looks like there's a few outliers that had some um, more robust uh, or, or worse lesions. Um, and then uh, the uh, higher virulence. So if you're um, basically uh, had a, a, your, pri your primary exposure was to a higher virulence strain, these birds enjoy a lot of protection mm -hmm. compared to the mm -hmm. ones that were mm -hmm. um, 
first given the lower virulent strain as an inoculum. Can I make a few points here? So I, yes. I, I think about virulence and its evolution a lot in terms of viruses because it, it's a really interesting subject, and I'm a little, I'm always puzzled because I'm not quite sure what to expect here. I mean, for example, what is the function of higher virulence if you're going to eliminate hosts, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's in fact, right. They, yeah. In fact, they mention that here. They talk about how um, host immunity reduces the costs of virulence to the pathogen by protecting hosts from disease-induced mortality, right? So that so virulence is a fitness cost, right? Because if you kill your host, you're never going to transmit, and that's the end of you, whether you're a bacterium or a virus. So any discussion of of virulence evolution has to consider that, and they do here, and I and I think that's fine. But not everyone does this idea that not it's not necessarily the case that every situation will select for higher virulence unless it makes sense, right? We did a yeah. paper a couple of weeks ago in Twitter where having low amounts of defective interfering particles in the virus makes for higher virulence because the virus doesn't induce as good an innate response. It replicates the higher titers, and you get an over-exuberant immune response. And so that's the other complication is that this this quant, this idea of virulence, viral virulence, or in this case, bacterial virulence, it's hard to dissociate from the host, which is actually causing a lot of the symptoms that you quantify as virulence, right? Now here they're, they're measuring vir- uh, bacterial loads, but the conjunctivitis could very well be a uh, host immune response. So it's a little complicated, right, to say that the virulence has increased when it's really the host. <laughs> yeah, no, that's <laughs> absolute. No, I totally agree. I mean, that's where the fact that they, you know, even so the high virulence primary infections um, aren't lethal, at least in this lab setting. Yeah, right. 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 And so I think that's how they're um, at least semi accounting for it. But again, that's yeah, a yeah. little bit of a trade off. And in, in I agree. The- but that's the thing that in, in nature, it's probably way more complicated than this. And so we're, we're, we don't really know what are the driving forces in nature. You know, in the lab setting, this is looks a little clear, but I'm always wary about that. Um, and the other thing you said is important. Um, uh, let's see, and I've just lost it. Uh, well, in the mean, yeah, let me. We'll get back to it. But in the meantime, I mean that what you just said about sort of the um, parallels with um, host immune mm-hmm. responses, especially in um, sort of viral infection. I mean, uh, when when you pointed out this paper, um, I was you know immediately thinking, oh, I'm wondering if Vincent is thinking about you know sort of this semi-parallel case of things like um, Zika virus after dengue infection, mm. where I mean that's a different. Maybe it's a um, sort of different. Uh, variation on the theme but if you are you know your primary exposure if that's to dengue um, then does that set you up either for a secondary infection or for a different infection yeah yeah right and how did those dynamics sort of play out in there right you, you this, these ideas of sort of host immune priming and the over exuberant mm-hmm, responses mm-hmm. And, and so it has some echoes i think of that biology as well i think you have to just remember it's not just the virus all the time okay don't just think about viral genes evolving or under selection and making more or less virulent it's always the host you have to consider as well that's both the the other thing here i got the thought i lost mm-hmm. <laughs> so this idea that a uh, a less virulent virus will give you incomplete immunity this is really contrary to what we think is the mechanism of attenuated viral vaccines, right? Mm -hmm. Polio vaccine, the the infectious polio vaccine, does not cause any disease. Yet it it protects you against infection. So I don't quite understand here why these less virulent mycoplasma are um, giving incomplete protection. You'd think they would be fine, right? I mean, maybe it's a matter of how much you replicate, right, for bacteria load and so forth. And I, I would love them to look into that at some point, you know, to try. Yeah, and yeah. So, I, yeah, no, absolute. So, I think, I mean, that's like, especially I think in virology, it's very, um, you know, we're, the history of virology with the attenuated strains is that you just perk up the immune system. Yeah. And then, right, with a weakened strain, low virulent strain in the parlance that we're using, and then you're you're great. I guess with this system and what makes it um, really interesting is the this idea that like maybe what you've done is you know just you've nudged the immune system but perhaps not 
um, gotten it to uh, alert it or, or caused an immune response that's strong enough or persistent enough to actually enjoy, um, you know, sort of real protection um, with future challenges. Yeah, I, I think that's perfectly possible. I would just like to know what is it, <laughs> you know, what, yeah, kind sure. of, <laughs> what kind of response do these birds have? Because I would say these less virulent strains se- seem like good vaccines, right? At least from our polio vaccine experience Correct. anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah, I mean, have there been, um, I'm tra- trying to think in the field of virology, have there been attenuated strains that uh, sort of like not only fail, but in fact, like you end up with uh, viruses that are even sort of stronger or, or more virulent, I should say. Um, well, that's hard to prove, right? Because you're always looking back and so you don't know right. what the selection was and so forth. But a paper came out uh, not too long ago. We did it on TWIV maybe a year or two ago. And they were looking at the Marix disease vaccine, which is a vaccine for chickens to protect them against the herpes virus infection, Marix disease herpes virus. And it's an infectious attenuated vaccine. And this study, which came out of uh, Penn State, I believe, they suggested that the vaccine didn't induce complete immunity allows challenge viruses to replicate and you select for higher virulence. So that was mm-hmm. the thesis of that. And we, I was a bit skeptical because again, you can't prove any of this because it's looking retrospectively and you're not sure exactly what the selection is in nature for any particular phenotype. You know, you can say in the lab, this is what happens, but you're never sure in nature. So, but that's the only example I can think of. Um, and it's certainly not, I'm not aware of any in humans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, nothing immediately comes to mind. So the Marix disease, that must be Andrew Reed's group. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm wondering if this study could kind of give a framework to move some of that the, these ideas into like a lab-based uh, sort of framework for asking that question. I but, think you, yeah. this is a nice study in that it gives you a system, but I think the details have to be worked out because there's a lot missing here to fill in the gaps, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, and then, you know, so at this point in the study, um, after they've sort of run these courses, um, and I think, again, I mean, this uh, reflects, you know, the um, interests and expertise of the uh, researchers, whereas uh, molecular biologists or cell biologists might be sort of drawn or um, sort of pulled along to kind of drill down on mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Measure, <laughs> measuring what are the what are the how do the immune responses differ between the correct you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the less virulent and the more virulent strains yeah that would be really <laughs> yeah 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 so I think that's it's sort of a fork in the road for the <laughs> yep. for experimental biologists and ecologists or not, I shouldn't say experimental or molecular biologists and ecologists um, whereas here the authors go a different direction I mean, equally as valid it just sort of uh, re- maybe reflects curiosity for other parameters which is to think about um evolutionary models or ecological models and then see how their data matches or, or reflects or might influence thinking about um, those models. And so um, they look at a couple, they fit to their data to a couple of models um, involving uh, disease-induced mortality and also um, host susceptibility in relation to um, virulence. And so this is in figure two. And um, um, and so we can look at basically the models, which are the, um, lines that are graphed, um, I guess with confidence around them in the sort of different colors in terms of, so mortality rate of the birds. Um, and then that's plotted, um, against on the X axis virulence of the second strain. So the secondary infection, um, and what that means for the mortality rate. And so the different lines are basically um, reflect the differences in primary exposures. So the control, which is the sterile medium. Um, and you see in the models that you would predict, you would see the highest uh, mortality uh, rates um, and uh, increasing as the virulence of the second strain increases. And then you sort of go down the ladder where if you're exposed to low virulence, me- medium or high, you see lower mortality. And then what they can do is take um, so the data they collected from the um, challenges they did to the house finches and see how that matches. And so um, 
it looks like some of the trends, I mean, this is just sort of a qualitative, um, you know, uh, op- looking at this, it looks like some of the trends hold. So the um, circles and triangles are colored based on whether the actual um, the empirical evidence they got from their experiments was either a uh, uh, low, uh, am I getting this right? Actually, yeah, the low or the high. Um, and so the high is in red, blue is low, and then you can see where their um, where the circles and the triangles land. Mm-hmm. And for the most part, it looks like it kind of matches, although you can see the numbers are a bit low here, but you can see um, if you look in the upper right quadrant um, of the graph, there is one of their individual birds that got the high dose, but then, um, or a set of birds that got the high dose, but then was, uh, has high, uh, you also observe high mortality rates as well. So it's sort of way off the chart there, outlier um, on the chart. Um, from here, they also go on to, um, t- so they, now that they have these models and, you know, maybe at least some um, of the patterns matching from the um, empirical data, they go on to um, run some simulations um, using, uh, uh, for, so they're basically trying to simulate pathogen virulence um, under conditions where the primary exposure um, involves uh, the low, medium, or high virulent, uh, uh, you know, primary uh, strains. And they're using for the simulations uh, what they um, call as an adaptive dynamics approach. And I just have to confess that um, I'm not a, you know, this is sort of not my cup of tea in the modeling or simulating uh, world here. And so um, I have to kind of, at least for me, uh, the details underlying that would be a, a pretty um, <laughs> pretty deep dig to try yeah, to yeah. try to get into. But if you look in figure three, and look at their simulations. Basically, they're consistent with the ideas that they've been um, proposing so far, um, which is basically um, as you um, sort of look at uh, birds that have either no immunity or incomplete immunity, that this will um, perhaps influence or cause the what they're calling now the invading strain, or looks to be, I guess, the equivalent of a um, secondary infection, or in sort of the simulated populations, it would basically be birds um, or individuals in a population that um, have incomplete immunity versus no immunity, that there's sort of this um, counterintuitive um, outcome where the ones with incomplete immunity are you're sort of selecting for higher virulence among the invading strains. And I think maybe what, another way to, to describe this would be that as a host population with incomplete immunity, what you've done is you've sort of um, raised the barrier to uh, an infectious microbe to sort of gain a foothold. And so the ones that make it are the ones that have higher virulence because they can get past that higher barrier that's in place. Or at least they grow better, right? Which is one of correct. the measures of virulence. Correct, correct. As Yeah, virulence as defined as um, pathogen load or, or yeah, yeah, yeah. growing better. And so, you know, that case, I mean, maybe uh, kind of putting that back into context with the um, how we think about um, successful, you know, virus vaccinations take like vaccinia for smallpox or something like that is where basically it's not incomplete immunity that you enjoy from the um, vaccinia vaccination, but it's sort of complete immunity. And so you've set the bar so high that at least so far we haven't, we don't know of any smallpox strains that can get past that. Whereas if you set this lower bar, then you're sort of as a population, the hosts are vulnerable to these higher virulence strains. And of course, what we see in nature is that high and low virulence strains both coexist, right? Because if this model were 100% right, everything should evolve to higher virulence. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and it, and well, it, it's not the case. We yeah. have a mix. So obviously, it's more complicated in nature, right? And I mean, we should point out that this mo- from this model, they conclude that incomplete immunity should favor the evolution of greater virulence. Whenever a high virulence strain makes stronger protection than low virulence strains. And the key here is should, because their experiments don't actually show that. All they show is that, you know, if you start with a high virulence strain, then you're better protected on challenge than if you started with a low virulence strain. So the corollary of that, and that's proven in their models, is that it should evolve to higher virulence. But we don't actually know if that in nature that would actually happen. 
Yep. And that's where the simulations sort of give that prediction that, that yeah. you might go yeah. back out. You can see whether that yeah. holds. Yep. And this is kind of the fun one of the fun things I think about um, ecological approaches or or kind of mixing quantitative approaches is that then you can have this really interesting back and forth between you know observation, modeling, or simulation, and then bringing that back to uh, either the laboratory or to refine sort of your experiments or your observations and then see how that, you know, how that then influences the model or the simulations and you sort of get more sophisticated as you go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's sort of the scientific progress to start because I mean, at least for me as sort of growing up as a reductionist biologist, like, like when you even just kind of scratch the surface of the complexity in actual real biological life, <laughs> things mm-hmm. are, mm-hmm. are really pitched and so how do you move forward and i think this uh, handoff between modeling and empirical approaches and sort of the back and forth of that is is a really as a tried and true true way forward they make an interesting case here that uh their their results say we have to be careful in designing human or any animal vaccine right because if it doesn't completely protect you may select for increased virulence according to their model right now the way we test vaccines at least in humans right we make sure they protect <laughs> right yeah um they do not lead to disease and most of the time i believe they are sterilizing although not every you know the polio vaccine depending on which one we talk about you know, the one that you get injected, the inactivating vaccine, is not sterilizing at all because the virus replicates in your gut. But there's no there's no selection for an increased virulence as a consequence of that. And I think that's because virulence of polio is an accident. And virulence mm-hmm. of polio is measured by virus getting into the central nervous system, which I, I would argue is an accidental byproduct. It has nothing to do with the actual ecology of polio virus. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a, probably a... An innocuous gut inhabitant that gets in your gut, it replicates, you shed it, it spreads to others, and most of the time doesn't cause any disease. So, you know, all these things you have to <laughs> take into account when you make, <laughs> when you make a really broad s- statement like that. It kind of it kind of um, makes me nervous because I can think of so many ways it's wrong and maybe right as well. You know what I mean, Nels? <laughs> I do. At the same time, maybe like looking at the other side of the same coin would be to think about. Um, and, and taking polio actually as an example is to think of put this into persp- the perspective of like the f- uh, probability of a uh, super high virulent strain emerging. So I agree with you about this sort of accidental, you know, um, sort of tourism of polio or other bugs. Mm. That then all of a sudden they move to the there's sort of this breakthrough. Um, I mean, it's an accident and it's, you, you know, there's no it's sort of random mutation and selection of just what persists. But you know, so with the sterilizing vaccines, um, whether what we've done is you've, we've just um, moved the probability so far into the host favor, in this yeah, case, humans right, favor. Right, right. But there could be some, you know, very improbable set of mutations or um, adaptations that would allow the, um, s- this virus to uh, break through that sterilizing immunity. And that would be sort of this ultra high frequency um, case. It's just mm-hmm. whether or not you've moved the probability so far that you're like relatively safe, um, or you know. And uh, yeah, so well, I yeah. think that it, it's we haven't. I agree that's totally possible. But that with the vaccines that we use in humans that work, we haven't seen that right. Because maybe you're right. It's pushed so far over that it's never going to happen. Yeah, thank goodness. Or it yeah. might happen, but more <laughs> and more kind of on an evolutionary time frame. Like if we came back yeah, maybe. in 5,000 years or something, maybe, and, and there's so many of these viruses, right, that they've sampled so much space that somehow they've broken mm-hmm. through or gained a foothold. Now, as they make this statement that we have focused on the small subset of pathogens that confer complete and lifelong immunity, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And I guess that's partially right because you can only license vaccines that work, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, the other sure. ones that don't work, which fail in clinical trials, maybe they fail in part because of incomplete immunity and and the challenge, you know, doesn't work and whatever. But it's not a, I mean, it, it's a problem in the sense that we haven't been able to get vaccines against those viruses. But for the most part, yeah, I, I understand the bias, but it doesn't illuminate the mechanisms in the other cases, though. 
Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, to be honest, I think there could be many mechanisms sure, for you for sure. protection, right? With some combination of um, selecting on host genetics, you know, outside of a sort of a medical context, um, or even just differences, individual differences in adaptive immune responses and mm -hmm. all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff comes back into play yeah. as well. Yeah. What do you think of this last sentence, Nels? Mm -hmm. They say, our results show that the same immune systems that evolved to protect hosts from infection can drive the evolution of more harmful pathogens in nature. I, well, yeah. <laughs> what do you think of that? <laughs> well, for me, it's sort of preaching to the choir. So this, you know, I've built <laughs> built my lab in part around this idea of these um, kind of recurrent right. genetic conflicts, yeah, right? These yeah. almost molecular arms races. And so, if you put up a stronger fence or a you know higher bar or something like that, you then um, the select the um, natural selection or the selective pressure shifts to the invading population um, or the, you know, the infectious microbe, if, you, if we want to narrow it down, um, until something breaks through, which then puts the selective pressure back on the host population um, as they're, um, you know, dealing with uh, the fitness consequences in a negative sense. Well, I, you at least acknowledge that it's a, a back and forth race. It's an arms race. But this statement makes it sound like we're screwed. It's going to go one way, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's and in fact, they say oh, we do not attempt to look at host susceptibility, right? Which is what you do. You you do both, and I think so. That's missing here. This kind of is, it makes you scared if you don't really mm. understand it, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and I mean, it's a question I get constantly: is you know how is it that hosts can persist given the fact that the seemingly the Microbes have all the advantages, massive populations, high mutation rates, short generation times, which mm, is sort of mm. outgunned in a sense. And so, I mean, the most, for me, for me, the most comforting answer, philosophical answer is, well, we're here, aren't we? And so um, that's uh, like good evidence stretching back for, you know, billions plus yeah. years that hosts can persist. At the same time, actually, I think there's a, um, the way we've been thinking about it more recently uh, there's a, a scientific basis to this as well, which is that we talk about, and it's an important point I want to raise, is that we talk about these arms races almost as if they're symmetric, mm -hmm, which is like mm -hmm. one side and then the other, yeah, yeah, when in yeah. fact, the interaction, the biological interaction is much more asymmetric. And by that, what I mean is that if you're a host, you just need one defense that works to block any given sort of generic um, pathogen. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're a pathogen, you have to either subvert or exploit or block every immune response that comes at you right and so that's a very different um sort of bar that the pathogens have to get across as we throw in parallel hundreds or even thousands of sort of immune strategies at these things yeah and yeah. they have to sort of beat them all whereas we just need one that is successful in any given sort of encounter i th i so. think that's why we're here right i think <laughs> i think it's hard to be a microbe you know, when you exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I always yeah. tell so, I always tell my classes every viral genome has to encode at least one immune antagonist, otherwise they're gone. Because we have really a good immune system, yep. right? It's incredibly broad and powerful, and the only viruses that succeed are those with antagonists. <laughs> well, so yeah, and usually, I mean, kind of like big compliments, both of antagonists. Um, or sort of the strategy of stealth, where you sort of either mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. you look host invisible, yeah, right? Exactly. So you're invisible, um, or you sort of fool the host into thinking. Uh, uh, there's another, I think, layer to this, which is a really cool evolutionary strategy that could emerge: is that the host might actually think that it's not only infected, but that it's um, responding in what has worked, like you know, over sort of a long period of time, and so the the uh, microbe. This is all sort of um, anthropomorphizing, but the the microbe has given the host this false sense of security that it's actually executing a, a productive immune response mm. when mm. because part of that response has been triggered, but it's also been sort of disabled or short circuited. So yeah, really interesting. I think strategies that can emerge from these ongoing collisions. So in that idea, I'm I'm puzzled by. Why, or not why, because you can't ask why questions. How would an immune system evolve of an animal to allow this to happen, right? To allow less virulent pathogens to put you at greater risk for high virulence pathogens. It doesn't make any sense in a way. If it were true, then 
as I said, all the back, all the mycoplasma would wipe out the finches, and, and that would be the end of it. But that's not what we see. The the low virulence ones are still out there. So it's a, I guess what I'm trying to say, it's a really much more complicated than this simple modeling would suggest. So, yeah, that's right. That's right. I agree. And in all of these cases, I mean, measuring the virulence load, it is it's uh, or the pathogen load as a measure of virulence. These are still, uh, certainly, I think, in the, the way this experiment is set up or in the lab setting, it's still a sub-lethal um, yeah, you know, yeah. dose. And you're not considering host fitness at all. They've sort of taken that off of the table. It's just thinking about yeah, yeah. what happens, like the focus of it is what happens to the pathogen. But at least, yeah, for me, t- kind of tying this up mm. is that it's also a really, um, I think, a really nice um, example of just how when you start to actually, you know, really consider real biological complexity outside of sort of a reductionist approach and try to, you know, yeah, start adding yeah. in all of it, like you, it doesn't take long to realize um, how complex these systems are. I mean, we need, we need reductionist systems to give us some, something to hang on, right. To do some more experiments and, and that's fine. But I just, be, I, I want people to be careful of making broad conclusions, right. Even the, even the title is, I think over, the top incomplete host immunity favors the evolution of virulence. Maybe, <laughs> I yeah, don't know, sure. yeah, you know, yeah. in this, in this very simple system, but I just think it's more complicated. I, I, I just like thinking and talking about it. I think it's really interesting, you know, so I'm glad that you can, we, you and I can have a conversation, but the whole issue is really neat. And, you know, because, and, and one of the things I said before, I'll just bring it up again, you know, this idea of virulence, I, I just don't like blaming the pathogen because, <laughs> If it's actually the immune response that is causing the conjunctivitis, say, <laughs> no, mm-hmm. bacteria is just trying to grow. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, so where does that put us? Uh, anyway, yeah. so it's I, I. There's a lot of people who work on this, and it's really fun to talk with. You know, Jim Bull at uh, at Austin. Yeah. Yeah. He's, of he's, yep. he's someone who's really interested in the evolution of. Oh, we had him on Twivo, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. He did some. We had his bioarchive paper where he's he was doing some modeling related to the gene drive. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he did. Yep. We didn't talk about. Maybe we should get him on sometime and talk about the evolution of virulence. Get his it's thoughts great, on it, you know. Yep, I agree. It's a great idea. I think what's instructive is, I mean, this is a, this is an interesting paper to talk about. But consider other systems and what do they tell us? You know, viruses of different sorts, bacteria, fungi, even. And what, is there an overall picture that we can start to derive some principles from? Yep. Yeah. All right. Cool. So I, that's why I suggested this because I, I like the topic. I was, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that um, it's all right, but it doesn't matter. The discussion around it is really interesting. <laughs> no, <laughs> absolutely. I think you've described um, science in general in some sense, right? I don't know of any perfect study out there. I would certainly, I mean, we do our best. We strive to do our best. I thought yours were perfect. Uh, consider all of the variables <laughs> <laughs> to design the best experience we can. Yes, of course, of course. And yep. And so, in that sense, you know, every study is going to. Oh, follow sure, sure. Yep. But yeah, I just but think I, virulence. I think I don't know something yeah. about it that that I I like, and so I like to get in arguments about it. <laughs> well, not arguments, but just discussion because I think it's pretty yeah. cool. And you know, there's this idea that viruses just evolve to protect their hosts and replicate and spread from host to host. And by that model, all viruses should be a virulent, but they're not, right? So this is obviously more complicated when you look at it. Oh, yeah. Yep. yep. No, it's fascinating. Okay. I'm, I'm cool. sorry to... Oh, not at all. But I I know I sense in you someone who's interested in talking about this topic, so... <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> it won't be the last time. Oh, yeah, that's for sure. Time. Should we do some uh, emails, Nels? Let's do it, because we also have a book drawing in the mix if i'm remembering yeah so we got 16 emails for this book which is viruses by michael cordingly and it's cool because it's inscribed he wrote in the side of it uh, to the twivo listener you know this is great science communication you know so it's kind of a personalized book for twivo listeners yeah nice so let's see i'll run through uh a couple and then you can and do uh, a couple. Sounds good. We yeah, got, should we alternate? Oops, yeah. So Anthony, oh, Anthony writes, please enter my email in the book drawing. On a related note, when I read The Origin of Species almost 40 years ago, I'd mentally replace variation with mutation. <laughs> I smiled when Darwin noted that domestication tended to induce variation. I thought it amusing 
that even someone as great as Darwin could fail to see that it was in inbreeding and the surfacing of hidden recessives. Now I wonder if it isn't captivity and the coincident exposure to viruses that indeed is inducing variation. Just a three thought. Well, you got to be careful that you know domestication is not inducing variation; it's selecting, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So change, just changing in the simplest sort of framing, I think just changing the environment where then selection can act on variation in different ways mm. or act on mutations in different ways. Do you think some, in some cases, viruses could induce variation? Yeah, of course. They're selective, yeah, of course. right? That's one of the strongest forces out there, right? If your yeah. fitness is being compromised because you're having a you know massive immune response and or sort of suffering yeah. from the consequences of infection in many ways, then that that's a that's an environmental perturbation that um, has ha- has pivotal uh, consequences, no yeah. question about it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, go ahead. So Steen writes, uh, writing in for a second shot at the uh, accordingly book. I second Irene's recommendation of the Taproot podcast. Um, Twivo number 27. Hosts Ivan and Liz are great. Uh, good discussions of career issues and work-life balance, as on recent episodes of TWIV. Incidentally, my brief uh, note that was read on TWIV 470 caused some minor confusion. I am a new postdoc in Siobhan Duffy's lab, not a new professor. I'll try to remember to note this <laughs> <laughs> the next time I write into TWIV. Steen. Well, you know, Steen, maybe by the next time you write in, you'll, you will be a professor. And so we can, you'll be able to sort of elegantly, gracefully move past Mm. Uh, that minor confusion. Well, we were uh, being uh, optimistic, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> or uh, predicting the future, yeah. uh, for sure. Yep. So, yes, thank you for this, um, the Taproot podcast, lifting that. So, I pulled up a different, uh, in defense of plants, a different podcast, but mm-hmm. I also actually had just saw this Taproot podcast. I was thinking about doing a back-to-back, um, you know, science pick, but this allows me to... Um, Diversify my science pick, but still we'll put the um, link to the Taproot podcast. That sounds like a really good one. Yeah, I, I started listening to the uh, In Defense of Plants. Mm-hmm. Um, wow, there are a lot of Taproots when you search. <laughs> I don't oh, know. Are there? Oh, okay. Taproots. <laughs> which one is the right one? Plants. Here you go. Society of Plant Biology. I guess that's it. Must be. Yep. Podcast that digs beneath the surface to understand how scientific publications are created. Wow. All right. I'll subscribe to that one. Yeah. Good one. I, I listened to uh, an episode of um, In Defense of Plants, and I got turned off because he has too much echo on his sound, you know? And I'm, oh, ju- I'm just too picky, you know? <laughs> Probably most people don't even notice it. But he did an episode with a grad student, and the grad student's sound was better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe we should connect him to your. Well, um, he seems to of, know what he's doing. He gets yeah. uh, he gets an episode out every week, and That's I'm impressive. I would not want to tell him fix your sound, but he should because I. Can't, you know. <laughs> yeah, it, this reminds this reminds me a little bit, Vincent, of um, skiing in Utah. You, you sit you're, when you live here for a couple of years. Um, you become a snow snob. Yeah, like you yeah. worry about the you worry about how much moisture is in the snow. Yeah, sure. so you're saying inches. you're saying I'm a podcast snob, right? Well, just when it comes to audio, maybe, yeah. <laughs> I just think it's important when you only have audio to make sure it's the best you can possibly be. I learned from people that that do that, you know. And yeah, I mean, in the beginning, our sound wasn't so good, and um, I fixed it. Yeah, no, I agree. It makes a difference, and even if you listen, like as I've. Of, as you've taken me under your wing, I've listened to some of our earlier episodes where um, some of our guests were just using, for example, their laptop mic. Yeah, that's so good, it right? Is a night and day difference, no question about no, it. No, sending people a headset is great. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, good idea. Yeah. Uh, Juan Antonio writes, "Thanks for the podcast." Emery writes, "I'd love to have a copy of the book. I'm a fan of the whole Twix series. Subscribe to all. I think they complement each other well. Thanks for your hard work. Can I do one more? Yeah, go for it." Uh, This is from Jake, who wants to be in for the book. He's a graduate student in evolutionary biology at Uppsala University in Sweden. His field is evolutionary developmental biology using zebrafish to study the the development of the jaw joint. Been interested in viruses for a long time. The two main podcasts that he listens to are Twiv and Twivo. Uh, He's interested in the interplay between virology and evolutionary biology, in particular the 
contribution of viral genes to the evolution of eukaryotes. A few years ago, I came close to undertaking a PhD with Tom Williams at the University of Bristol, studying viral contribution of essential genes in the origin of eukaryotes, but in the end decided that pure bioinformatics wasn't for me. The topic of viral contributions to animal evolution now fascinates me, from classic examples uh, like the syncytions in placental mammals to the regulatory functions that the remnants of viral sequences have contributed. Wow, what story would that be now? <laughs> <laughs> Good one. <laughs> well, yeah, from from a paper of viewers we did on TWIV, right? Uh, not, uh, let's see. Well, the, you, not the sensation. Not the sensation, the, sensition, sensation, the like, regulatory yeah. elements to, in the interferon right, promoters, right. yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there's, I mean, there's so many stories still lurking in addition to the ones that are out there. Yeah, it's fascinating. Well, that story made it into my, my virology course, man. So you're like... Oh, awesome, I'm... I am <laughs> flattered. I'm honored and thrilled. <laughs> One of my favorite papers was published in Cell in 2015 entitled Enhancer Divergence and Cis Regulatory Evolution in the Human and Chimp Neural Crest from Joanna Wasaka's lab at Stanford. It's a marvelous paper in its own right detailing the divergence in cis regulatory elements of key genes that dictate the divergence in the craniofacial morphology of humans and chimps. But there's a little connection to viruses to sweeten the deal. The team looked at the kinds of sequences that the divergent enhancers were embedded in and found that several classes of ERVs and LTR retrotransposons were enriched in the enhancer motifs, implying that some of the motifs they highlight the coordinator motif might have had their origins in these viral sequences. Mm -hmm. I love examples like that of how even at fundamental level, viruses have influenced our evolutionary trajectory, so I think Michael Cordingley's book would be a fascinating read. I'm pleased to see a chapter dedicated to Ebola viruses. I was lucky enough to attend a seminar by Simon Lovell from the University of Manchester a while back about his work characterizing the 2014 outbreak. Weather here are brisk minus five. Skies are gray. A few inches of snow on the ground from last night. Mm. Nice. Yeah, thanks, Jake. That's really great. Speaking, maybe echoing on the um, Wysocka work, there's a fellow, Ed Groh, uh, who mm -hmm. was a grad student there. He's now a postdoc uh, right. here at Utah with Brad Cairns. He's dabbling in some of the examples of how IRVs, LTRs, and related um, elements have had pivotal influences on evolution as well. So lots of, I mean, lots of amazing biology. Yeah, we, we have an email from Ed in the queue for next time uh, ah. suggesting uh, some papers to do, in fact. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Okay, I'll do the next one. Tom writes, I listen to 20 different podcasts, and Tuivo is my favorite. Well, that's I'm done right there. Can we, can we, can <laughs> we give, give him the, the book? book? Sure. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Please enter me in the contest. Uh, I only enter contests when the books sound like they're within my grasp and of interest, and also not so costly that it would be wasteful to give to a uh, biology dilettante like me. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Uh, stories about evolution inspire me to think in new ways. There are so many evolutionary paradigms to learn, and it is all exciting. Maybe you can do a book or ebook giveaway on Patreon. I need an edge. Tom. Uh, 12 degrees C, 97% humidity, rainy but not stormy. Warm springs, water, reservoir storage. Does, we're getting to the weeds here. Two, 200,000 uh, one five nine five acre feet inflow hundred cubic feet per second outflow ninety cubic. <laughs> cool, love it. Yeah, the reservoir. Start. I wonder if there's any. I don't know about where Warm Springs is. But I'm wondering if there's trout fishing downstream there. If we're thinking, worrying about acre feet, I might have to call in um, Dixon for a consult here. That's a good idea, Tom, to uh, do something on Patreon because we have lots of supporters there. So we'll give away a book on Patreon one of these days. Yeah, great idea. Uh, Josh writes, hi, Vincent and Nels. I'm a grad student at Boston College in Welkin Johnson's lab. I commute down from New Hampshire every day. Wow. And the Twix podcast definitely helped with the drive. I hope I win the book. Thanks for all you do for communicating science. Good to hear from you, Josh. I was just um, out at Boston College where the mm -hmm. Welkin lab. Did you meet Josh? Boston. Yeah. Cool. Out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and take the next one. Brian writes, hi, Vincent and Nels. I'm a public health student at Indiana Purdue University in Indianapolis, and I'm a huge fan of Twivo and the entire Twix empire. I really enjoy listening to your conversations and staying fresh with some of the uh, latest research. Keep the episodes coming. Regards, Brian. Thanks, Brian. We're going to take the next one, too. Okay. This is Yasal. Hello, Nels and Vincent. Thank you for the great podcasts. I subscribe and listen to the Twee series, trying to learn and take advantage 
of the maddening hours I spend on the road for a daily commute. I would love to win the book. Uh, tried before, but haven't been lucky yet. I am a nurse from Cedars uh, Sinai in Los Angeles. Just finished a master's program in biomedical sciences. Interest began with oncology and immunology, um, with a specialty in bone marrow transplant nursing. So coming from the clinical world, but fascinated with biomedical research, especially genetics, genomics. I used to think genetics was boring. <laughs> <laughs> in the Punnett Square and drawing pedigree um, zone. That doesn't, uh, I apologize if I offend anyone. I don't think you're apolog- offending anyone there. <laughs> <laughs> Significance of classical genetics. Um, but I enjoy the genomic side of things a lot more. Uh, I diligently listen to your episodes, but they're still often over my head. That's uh, about to change. Starting this fall, my husband and I are moving to Idaho to pursue our PhDs. We're about to achieve two big dreams. Number one, living in a rural or or, um, (laughs) agricultural area. And number two, studying for a living. So that's basically why I would love this book. Hmm. It goes on a little bit, uh, da-da-da. But thank you, Yasol. Great letter. And congrats on the um mo- the impending or ongoing move to Idaho for PhDs yeah. i think that sounds amazing yeah, good luck with that yeah definitely i seem to remember you saw from immune i think uh, she wrote a cool. letter there or not writes hello uh, i'm writing from bangladesh hmm. did my undergrad in biology at florida state got a masters in molecular micro and immunology from johns hopkins worked with sabra klein on the effects of testosterone on the outcome of flu infections. She gave a great talk at ASV last year. Mm. Side note, gender differences in the immune response could be a nice area to explore. And immune, you bet. I'm a lecturer now in biochemistry at Independent University in Bangladesh, mostly involved in epidemiological research here. Been a huge fan of Twix ever since I discovered Twivo two years ago. I love them all, but there's a special place in my heart for Twim and Twivo. I'm going to apply for PhD programs in 2017. These podcasts have helped me narrow down areas of interest. I could listen to you talk about genetic conflicts, pigeon evolution, and other spicy topics all day, and often do when I am stuck in traffic for hours. Listen to this. Spicy, that's a word from Nels. Yeah. I feel a little guilty to be writing in for the first time just for the book lottery. I will try to write in more often. Know that Twix is the pinnacle of podcast evolution. (laughs) Thank you. Pretty great. Thanks, Arnav. Really nice message. All right. You're next. Uh, Ari. 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 Hi, Twivo and Twiv folks. I'm writing uh, to enter for, uh, enter for the book, but mostly because I feel like I should write and thank you for doing your wonderful series of podcasts. 29 degrees Fahrenheit minus 1C in the area which I study. Uh, don't know if it says where that is. Evolution of a virus. Oh, not in place. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Fourth, it's okay. Fourth year PhD student. Uh, rather odd situation. I'm going to be a little vague on detail in case certain people are listening. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. I'm intrigued to get here. Uh, first, I study the evolution of a virus, but my background is largely zoology. Uh, gained a lot of knowledge about virology in my time in the program. Largely self-taught, since uh, the program lacks a virology course, and so. Um, Ari used uh, Vincent's 2014 lecture videos uh, and, and as an independent study course. Anyway, with my odd knowledge base, uh, it certainly makes me an outcast since I don't quite fit in with biology or environmental departments. I'm more of an outcast since I'm an academic orphan. Due to several new jobs, I only have two of five committee members on campus. This makes for a rough situation uh, when I run into trouble since there's no one around uh, to show me how to run certain programs I need. Um, sounds like a challenging situation, unable to get the data I need, disheartening to try to continue research with so many people sort of indirectly against you. I'm looking, um, at an extra year, uh, because of the politics and I'm not sure I'll be able to publish in a very high journal. Uh, here's where the thank you comes in. It's been a real struggle to get through my degree. I was hitting a really low point in my enthusiasm for research when I stumbled across your virology an evolution podcast. I wasn't aware of the podcast back when I was going through your course. 
Slowly but surely, you've been restoring my appetite for the unknown and maybe also putting me back on the path towards academia, despite all my apprehensions about grants and whatnot. I haven't uh, had a real journal club since my master's degree and your podcast are making up for that. So thanks a million. I may do more than muddle through. Mm -hmm. Sincerely, Ari. Wow, Ari, really nice note. Um, as for all of the um, trouble and, um, and the challenges and the obstacles, first of all, um, know that you have um, the sort of empathy and sympathy from people all over the place. Um, and that you're not alone. There are a lot of people who have um, unfortunately gotten into situations where, I mean, I, I would say, Vincent, you know, the the science is hard enough uh, and complex enough as it is to make progress. And then when other obstacles can get thrown in your way, which happens way more than uh, any of us would hope, uh, that only makes sort of what can be challenging, you know, in some cases, like, you know, it, it can stop you in your tracks. And there will be challenges always. <laughs> Because people That's are right. people, right? <laughs> Correct. Yeah, yeah. And so dealing with uh, politics, um, as Ari is pointing out, and other related things. That's right. It's um, can really feel like um, the wind is sort of yep. uh, in your face uh, many times in our career. Even under, I think, the best of circumstances, um, that can be the case. And so, really thrilled to hear that you are um, finding some enjoyment and inspiration in our podcast. That, that really um, it helps make it worth it for us as well. Eric is a grad student in marine, studying marine pathogens, listens to all the podcasts, and is a fan of the side banter. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Alex wants to win the book and wants advice for undergraduates going through the summer internship process. What would you look for in a CV or cover letter? Are, you, are there any red flags? Mm. Thanks for all the wonderful podcasts. Well, I always tell people just pick people you're interested in, email them your CV and um, have a good description of what you're done and what you're passionate about and curious about. I think being interested is really important. What about you, Nels? What do you think? Yeah, 100% uh, agree. I also think, you know, if you can express a little bit of that interest, even in that email, where it's not, so where it comes across as not just, oh, I need a summer job or want to gain lab experience or, you know, you can even, I mean, you can, <laughs> it can get dangerous if you're too honest. If you say, well, I, I want to go to medical school and I need some lab experience. So I just, like, as if you want to sort of check that box. Yeah. If you can avoid that and instead, and hopefully it's sincere, but even if, <laughs> even if you are thinking medical school, that's just fine. Um, but if you, but to sort of couple that with some real curiosity um, where you're picking labs that are at least during research where you're just sincerely like, whoa, this looks interesting. And to then express that in sort of a few sentences. And so that might, you know, a little bit of legwork up front to just, first of all, figure out what are some of the research areas that um, kind of sincerely grab your attention and interest. And then secondly, to um, spend at least a little bit of time just uh, seeing how those interests potentially connect to the lab that you're writing to or making contact with to, to sort of jumpstart your application. If you're, if a quick email it doesn't have to be long, but if a quick email can um, sort of illustrate that spark or that curiosity, I think that goes a really long way. And if they don't answer, just wait a few days and try again and, you know, say, I'm really sorry to bother you. I just want to make sure you didn't miss this because we're all crazy with email and, you know. Absolutely. We'll and also, <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think, especially when you're starting out, to take a pretty um, liberal view of, uh, of um, you know, trying to, you know, not carpet bomb or blanket, but just um, not just sort of focus on one specific lab, but, you know, yeah. think about maybe you bet yeah. m many that could potentially work just because of the timing of things is always up in the air for sort of the life of any lab will be growing or shrinking at different times. And so it's uh, good to be flexible that way as well. All right. Okay. Uh, you're next hey, with Austin. Yes. Austin writes, hey, Vincent, hey, Nels, I'm definitely writing to try for the book. Also wanted to tell you how much I enjoy your podcast. Uh, I like all of the Twix casts, but Twivo is definitely my favorite. I don't really use my biology education as a pharmacy technician. Listening to the um, two of you discuss evolution is easily my favorite aspect of biology, both as a subject and as a universal occurrence in life. It gives me something to look forward to. Working at a large facility gives me access to the papers you read, so I don't have to wait and, uh, to go back to school to follow along. Thanks again, 
and keep them coming. Thank you, Austin. Really nice note. Um, and glad that you're uh, enjoying the the uh, podcast and also that you do have access um, to some of the papers. We, tr- we try to really include ones that are publicly um, accessible, uh, but we kind of follow our nose to the um, science that's interesting and that kind of gets us into these, um, you know, um, paywalls from time to time. It's important to, to let us know how much you like Twivo. Otherwise, Nels might not do it anymore. <laughs> I don't know about that. We're, <laughs> now that we're approaching our 30th episode, it feels like we have uh, some wind in our sails. It's a good momentum here. Good number, yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Kaim writes, uh, thanks for a great podcast. I'm a computational immunologist, and one of my main research interests is the evolution of B-cell receptors and the adaptive immune response. It tends to be a fairly narrow view of evolution, though, so I appreciate that Twivo helps give me a broader perspective. Hmm. Nice note. Uh, Laura writes, hello, my name is Laura. I'm a relatively new listener to Twivo. I manage a small lab in Colorado and have been trying to find a good podcast to keep up with cool news on the science front when I stumbled across the This Week in series. I've been making my coworker listen to the (laughs) podcast while we are working and have all been greatly enjoying the episodes. So thank you very much for all of the energy you put into the series. Regards. Laura. Thank you, Laura, for letting us know. That's really great. Um, I kind of, I don't know about you, Vincent, but I kind of um, like this idea. So we've, you know, some themes are emerging both uh, from commuting or, you know, perhaps being in the lab with long hours, you know, maybe doing some work. And I I kind of, this idea of a podcast um, like Twebo, just sort of, you know, being there in the background a little bit, like sort of the analogy I've been trying is it's sort of like having a, a fireplace in the corner. Mm-hmm. You kind of go over, you can warm your hands for a few minutes and there's something comforting <laughs> about having it uh, nearby. And so um, if if that's what we're doing here, I count me in. It's, I, I like that. I, I just like the energy of this myself. Yeah, I think you could have it in the background and, you know, you hear something particularly interested in or sounds a little confusing. You move over and listen a little carefully for a few minutes. That'd be cool. Yeah. Or rewind to the fire. Yeah. Minutes and yep. I do that sometimes when I'm listening to Twiv and you know, I've kind of if I'm daydreaming and yeah, sure. <laughs> something catches my attention, I'm like, oh my goodness, what did Yeah. They mentioned my name. What did they say? Kathy yeah, or, oh well not necessarily me, but what did Kathy just say? And then I'll rewind back and listen to the um, banter back and forth. It's really, really All right, the last one is from Christian he Christian is from an MMJ laboratory in Colorado. My manager and I le- started listening to your podcast recently and love it. I'd love to be entered in the virus book contest. Okay. 16 entries. Thank That's you. That's great. I'm guessing Laura and Christian might be in the, are, are these part of that same lab in Colorado? I would say so. Yeah, look at That's, that. Colorado. Could yeah. be. Totally legal. That's yeah, two, no separate, two, two separate, separate entries. entries. Okay. Yeah. We're going to do a <laughs> random number between one and 16. Are you hey. ready, bro? I have a random Drum number roll. generator. Drum roll, please. Number seven. Number seven. Who's number seven? Got to count down from the top. We'll do this in uh, One, two, three, four, five, six, seven is Josh from Wilkin Johnson's lab. Josh, yep. That's what I hit too. Congrats, Josh. And thanks for playing. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Josh, just send me your address. Twivo at microbe.tv and we'll get this book out to you. It's pretty cool. It's autographed. It's got a little saying in the front. Not every day you get one of those. Thanks to um, Michael Cordingly for yeah. doing that. Agree. And let's wrap this up with some picks of the week. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. What do you got, um, Nels? So my pick of the week just came across the um, Twitter radar last night was this um, web small website that takes uh, common algorithms and explains them with IKEA-like instructions. So hopefully uh, most of us are, we'll have the link, but hopefully most of us are fam- familiar probably with um, uh, <laughs> IKEA assembly with the sort of strange Swedish cartoons um, and strange Swedish names. And so, um, oh, this is, um, so the instructions here are by um, Sandar, um, Fouquet, Sebastian Moore, and Sebastian Stiller. And um, they, I think, are in Germany, in um, Braunschweig. 
uh, <laughs> and I'm just <laughs> really trying for a pronunciation there. Um, and so what they've done is taken some very common algorithms. So things like the quick sort, um, merging algorithms, um, graph scans, even like, um, uh, crypt, uh, cryptography keys, public keys, binary searches, for example, and then reimagine them as if they were, uh, in, uh, an Ikea item to be assembled. And so, um, the quick sort, for example, I think is pretty clever where you have all of these different, um, you know, values basically, or a set of things. And then how does the algorithm work to take the, so to quantify these, to sort them from like quantitatively lowest to highest, um, and so this is uh, repackaging how that algorithm works into IKEA-like instructions. Pretty clever. That's I don't cool. know if beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. yeah, yeah. Good. Uh, I, it's a, I like it. It's a yeah. good idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, whether or not you get through all of the, whether you can just like actually an IKEA project, or you might end up with some extra screws or some confusion about what you've just tried to build. You might not get every detail, but it's a uh, cool way of trying to um, sort of imagine explaining these common algorithms yeah the drawings are great love it yeah cool how about you vincent what's your science pick of the week oh i have a blog called it is not junk and not is in uppercase <laughs> it's a blog about genomes dna evolution open science baseball and other important things by michael eisen who i'm sure you know of Nels, right yeah no we're science buddies yep biologist at uc berkeley uh, and co-founder of public library of science and I think he was running for senator in California, wasn't he? That's correct. Technically, maybe still the last. I ran into him <laughs> maybe about a month and a half ago, and it sounded like um, well. So what happened was um, Diane Feinstein announced that she was running again, and that sort of changed the whole dynamic um, mm. of the race. And there is a you know so the primaries in California are aren't. Um, there's not like one Democrat, one Republican, they're open primary. Yeah, so that's right. You can say, right. yeah, so you end up with, you know, in, in, um, uh, oftentimes Democrats versus Democrats. Mm -hmm. And so that changes the, the dynamic as well. So yeah, I yeah, think yeah. at least for that specific race, um, he's not actively okay. um, in the game. Yep. I like this because he's extremely opinionated and writes well and, says things that maybe other people would not. So, for example, some of his recent columns, he doesn't write all that often. This is from July last year, but the abysmal response of the Salk Institute to accounts of gender discrimination in its midst. Patents are destroying the soul of academic science. Replace Francis Collins as NIH director. <laughs> <laughs> Exploring the relationship between gender and author order and composition in NIH-funded research. So lots of science relevant things and i really like it and um he writes well so you should check it out yeah i agree with mike like you never are left wondering like well, what do you how do you really feel yeah for sure <laughs> for sure that's great and you know mike also had a um uh, sort of pivotal hand in the um, emergence of plus biology a lot of open access mm -hmm. uh, publishing he's sure. really a pi pioneer in sure. that area totally uh, yep also has spent some time uh, thinking about, uh, or he's affiliated with this uh, outfit called Impossible Foods. Have you heard about? No. This What's company? that? Yeah, really interesting. Maybe I'll add a link uh, if I can do like a pick point two or something like that. Would be Impossible Foods. So this is um, a food company that um, Pat Brown, who um, had a pretty famous lab at Stanford for many years, he's shifted his efforts and attention completely into this company. And mm. the, the idea is to create um, plant-based burgers as the first sort of killer app, in mm -hmm. a sense, to replace beef as um, the main item. And so, you know, they went at this with a really a scientific perspective um, to try to uh, innovate in what a sort of edible and even sort of delicious or attractive plant-based burger would look like. And so a lot of... Um, thinking uh, kind of deconstructing back to the biology and thinking about like, what does that taste the iron or the blood? And so they actually use plant heme mm. to bring this in. Um, there are coconut oil globules that sort of, um, replace the, um, you know, the marbling of the beef and our, mm -hmm. sort of, so it's really a, yeah, it's really a, can you buy these things? 
you you can't currently buy them retail. There are yeah. uh, more and more restaurants um, mm-hmm. that have launched it, probably in the hundreds now across the country. I've had I've tried one. I think it's pretty good, really compelling. Um, where you're kind of thinking, wow, I just ate a burger, hmm. um, as opposed to I just ate a veggie burger. That distinction is uh, yeah. <laughs> pretty high bar to cross. And so, so that's yeah, that, what Pat Brown is doing there. Correct. Wow. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, and the company is growing like crazy. So a cool. lot of venture capital is coming in behind. And you know, I think the organizing principle, to some degree, is that basically, if you look at the environmental um, burden that cattle production and um, the whole beef industry puts on things like greenhouse gas emissions, oh, yeah, sure. global warming, climate change, that this is a huge input. And so if we can, if you can bend the curve, even a small way, um, that that could have a, a really big impact uh, environmentally. Cows, pigs, and chickens, the three of them, man. Yeah, exactly. And cows are kind of off the charts, I think. Yeah. Uh, Goats and lambs, I think, are actually a pretty big impact as well. Obviously, a mm. much smaller footprint in terms of total numbers that um, humans yeah. uh, keep. Um, and then pork comes in behind that, and chickens are a little bit lower. I mean, if you really want to get serious about um, continuing to be a carnivore, um, things like lizards and insects might be your best bet if you also want to um, you know, really lower your carbon mm. footprint. I like my quinoa burgers. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of great emerging options out there and uh, you know fish makes a great burger too like uh, salmon or other fish yeah there's a lot of good stuff that i don't know it doesn't have to taste like a hamburger to me (laughs) yeah 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 but i understand that some people might like that so that's great cool nice all right tweevo 29 apple podcast microbe.tv slash tweevo you can find it on your podcast player on your phone or tablet please subscribe to us come out once a month you'll get it automatically And when you're on that long road trip or assay in the lab, you can listen without having to worry about downloading. And if you like us, consider financial support. Helps us to do more and do a little traveling. Microbe.tv slash contribute. And send your questions and comments to Twevo at microbe.tv. We'll give away another book soon. Yeah. Um, We like doing that. It's apparently a good way to get your to hear about you. So. <laughs> That's right. Get some feedback. <laughs> <It's cool. laughs> that was great. <laughs> Nels LD can be found at cellvolution.org. He's on Twitter as L Early Bird. Thanks, Nels. Hey, thank you, Vincent. Fun to talk as usual. You bet. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music you hear on Twivo is by Trampled by Turtles. They're at trampledbyturtles.com. Been listening to This Week in Evolution podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick thanks for joining us we'll be back next month till then be curious